So uh, I'd like to start the webinar by thanking our members over at TVA today. They are hosting a meeting for our power group. Um, as you know, we have uh, quite a few members uh, focused on power initiatives. Today, they are breaking away from their in-person meeting to provide you with a webinar on small modular reactors, SMRs. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to our host, Mike Dubril with PTAG. He will introduce our lineup of speakers and go ahead and share with you a bit today. We will have a Q&A session at the tail end of the presentation. Uh, we do have a Q&A panel that you'll see here in gray. Um, if you click the little box with the arrow, that will expand that section so you can type in a question and we'll go ahead and address that at the end. If for some reason we don't get to your question, we're happy to send you an email back in response. So again, we thank you for joining us live today in at TVA. Um, Mike Debril, we'll go ahead and let you kick it off. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jenny. And uh, thank you, Rod Stanhope and TVA for hosting. We are sitting uh, here in a meeting room at the Kingston uh, Power Plant. And we were fortunate enough to have a tour of that yesterday. Truly an impressive facility. Today we're going to talk about collaborative contracting, what we at uh, the CII call industrial integrated project delivery. Um, we're going to talk about collaborative contracting for small modular reactors. This is a bit of a, a longer presentation format. It's an hour and a half with about 30 minutes of questions at the end. So save your questions up and get them out to Jenny through the uh, go to uh, uh, widget on your screen. Uh, today, um, I will be talking uh, particularly on the world of SMRs. Uh, Dr. Phil Baruto will be talking specifically uh, on what industrial integrated project delivery is. We're not doing a deep dive here, the assumption is enough of you uh, understand the theory or have access to the theory of collaborative contracting, but he's going to talk to it uh, at a level that hopefully is enough for folks to understand the whole presentation. Uh, Bruce Burwell is going to wrap us up at the end. He's going to talk about how you would go about implementing and how we are implementing uh, collaborative contracting industrial IPD for small modular reactors and, and, and how well that's going. Um, Kathy uh, is going to be speaking to us uh, with respect to the modularization CBA and some of the best practices that have come out of that. And then Rod uh, Stanhope is going to be speaking to us uh, with respect to nuclear here at TBA and why the SMR program. Uh, so that's your lineup of speakers. And with that, we will begin. So I guess many of us here in the room, and hopefully many of you on, on the webinar itself have heard this concept, energy in transition. You know, our whole two-day meetings were all about how we in the power in industry, and we think in the broader industry as well, uh, chemicals, um, uh, oil and gas, and, and the mining sectors are going to be looking at energy in transition uh, for industry, uh, but it's also energy in transition for societies as a whole, specifically as we look at uh, uh, electric vehicles and the electrification around the world. What this graph here shows you is that we expect between now and uh, 2050 for the consumption of power to go up substantially. Uh, and and the, the, in one, one form in, uh, of measurement is in BTUs, and it's, it's, it's in the trillions of uh, BTUs. And so the Consumption by sector, as uh, this slide shows, shows that transportation, uh, commercial, residential, and industrial are all expected to have an increase uh, 
in energy requirements, and so particularly in the areas of transportation. And again, that comes to the electrification uh, of our uh, cars and trucks, uh, and maybe even airplanes at some point. The another way of measuring the um, form of energy that we're going to produce is in the what they call exajoules. And this chart here shows in 2021 where we're at in terms of energy requirements and then specifically uh, electricity. Energy is also used in the form of heat, steam, and many other forms that, that drive society. And you can see as you go from 2021 to 2050, the, we're looking at a significant increase. And in particular, we're looking at energy electricity as a percentage of overall energy requirements going from 20% to roughly 30% by 2050 as we electrify our, um, our uh, society. Um, yeah, so as we take a look at uh, different uh, research uh, folks out there. I, I selected this slide from a group called Statistica in particular because uh, it, it shows what a number of us in the, in the power industry believe it's going to have to be the case if we're going to provide such an increase in power and a stable, reliable, clean increase in power that the supply of nuclear globally is going to go from 6.9% to 14% of the global electrical generation by 20. But that translates is we have a lot of generation to build. Um, world nuclear and, and uh, world total and nuclear uh, electric, uh, you see in this graph here, and uh, we go from, you know, where we are today, where nuclear uh, represents roughly 10% globally of um, uh, total supply. Um, as all the plants start to uh, uh, get refurbished, uh, new plants come online, particularly the small modular reactors that we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. Um, you see that nuclear is expected to grow to, in 2050, up to as much as 14% of our total electrical production. The Price of electricity as we add electrification to the globe to, our, to industry, society as a whole, the price uh, of electricity matters. And as you can see there uh, in that main chart, uh, nuclear is in and around uh, 10.1 cents uh, per kilowatt versus hydro at 6.1. And then you can see what the others are. So nuclear is uh, an, an affordable. Uh, form of uh, power supply, and that's nuclear as a whole. So why nuclear for net zero? For us to reach the carbon reduction goals that society has set for, for us, uh, why nuclear? And you know, the biggest one that, that's touted and why nuclear is so popular today is nuclear is carbon free. At the end of the day, when it's up and running, the plants generate zero from the production of electricity. Um, nuclear energy has proven itself uh, for the last 60 years as a safe, reliable, low cost, low carbon generation. And it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days. It doesn't matter if the sun shines or the wind blows, nuclear operates. Um, and a number of the facilities, um, you know, they only come down for. Um, uh, significant outages in a couple of years. Uh, and an interesting stat is that uh, nuclear generates more electricity with less land than any other renewable source of energy. And, you know, highlighted there in red, what's really cool is when you take a look at the equivalent of 300 small modular reactors. Uh, 
all in that 300 megawatt range. The equivalent wind um, power would require 13 million acres of land to generate that much electricity. And solar require uh, 2.3 million acres of land. And I did the math on, the, on these, uh, these 300, 300 megawatt SMRs, and it's something in, in the neighborhood of uh, 75,000 acres compared to 13 million versus 2.3 million. So the, you know, the impact on the environment, the impact on land as a resource is significantly less, uh, which doesn't get mentioned a lot. So, you know, to meet our global energy requirements by 2050, it's, it's estimated that thousands of these small modular reactors will have to be built. Uh, and, and for those that are not familiar with SMRs or small modular reactors, they are a new generation of nuclear that go from as small as uh, one megawatt to as large as uh, 300 plus megawatts. Um, above the, the 300 megawatts, somewhere between 300 and 500 megawatts, you get into what we call new nuclear or, or traditional uh, 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 sized nuclear. Um, so, the fact that we're going to, to, to meet just the, the Canadian and US requirements translates to 100 grid scale, 300 megawatt SMRs in Canada by 2050. And using that 10 to 1 ratio, that means down here in the US, we'll be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 of those 300 megawatts. So, If you look at different sources of funding that, that are out there between Canada and the U.S. and, and all around the world for, for that matter, government has committed sizable, I'm not going to walk you through all of this, I've included it in the deck, and this deck will be available to you. Um, uh, governments have put sizable amounts of money aside to help industry and society uh, plan and build these new uh, nuclear uh, facilities. And here you'll see the, the ones listed uh, for the Canadian uh, government. Um, in the US, um, again, it's a factor of 10 increase, but uh, here I've listed again the, the different types of funding that are available to industry to help them uh, move forward with uh, planning uh, for the small modular reactor. One thing about small modular reactors is it takes time. It, you, there's 10 to 15 years from decision to say we're going to do it to actually have the unit up and running. That has a lot to do with regulatory, particular um, regulatory uh, compliance and uh, licensing for these facilities to operate safely. When you look out in the landscape right now, we are as we've seen many times in my lifetime, uh, based on technology, we are in a race. We are in a race to see who, which technologies are going to come to the forefront. There are over 70 SMR designs right now across 17 countries, all vying for a piece of the market opportunity. Not all of them are going to make it. And uh, these charts are generally out there and available. Uh, I pulled this from a source again called Statistica. Um, the, the list on the right that, that lists all the various SMR technologies, where they're at, and their various stages of development that comes from Wikipedia. Uh, having said that, there are projects and industry that have started to make commitments. So here, uh, a member of CII, Ontario Power Generation up in Canada, they committed to build the first grid scale small modular reactor, <coughs> 300 megawatts. Uh, it's a VWRX uh, unit. And they began 
with their community engagement back in 2022. They're using uh, an integrated project delivery as the delivery method, and they're in their validation phase, which is the preliminary design, uh, preliminary estimates, and uh, schedule to build this up. They, they're expecting to be in service as early as 2029. God bless that they can make that date. Uh, in nuclear, the world does not move at the same pace as other parts of industry. And a number of lessons of learning. They're in the uh, uh, early licensing, pre licensing of, of the design for the BWRX, uh, working with CNSC. And as you'll see later, they're uh, also working with the US NRC. And the two licensed licensing bodies, both in Canada and the U.S., are working together. And as a matter of fact, they're working with other jurisdictions around the world to ensure that these units get built safely, but get built on a timely and affordable basis. Um, UNSC is known as a micro uh, modular reactor, so an MNR. They have um, partnered with Ontario Power Generation and Canadian Nuclear Laboratories up uh, on the Chalk River, uh, about two hours west of Ottawa, to build a demonstration site. Um, and so they're in the licensing review as well, and the preliminary engineering and planning uh, for, for the for the uh, facility itself. Uh, New Scale uh, is a medium-sized small multi reactor in Idaho Falls. Uh, they're expected to be the first U.S. SMR power plant in operations. And it's uh, Utah Association Associated Municipal Power Supply that uh, are, are the owner. They started their engagement with the community back in 2015, and they're in the feasibility study. And then I'm going to turn it over to Rod, and he's going to talk about the TVA um, nuclear power in general, and then bring it specifically to their SMR program. So, Rod? Yep. Yeah. Maybe sound check. I assume we're on the same microphone. So yeah. So uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us. So we're at uh, the Kingston Fossil Plant today in TVA at TVA. But uh, um, T a nuclear at TVA is is has been and will continue to be our cornerstone of our portfolio. Uh, we don't see having the ability to uh, serve our serve our region and, and uh, fulfill our mission without it. So we are owners and operators of nuclear facilities, we're constructors of nu nuclear facilities, obviously, along with our, uh, our partners and uh, providers, but uh, it, it will be, uh, continue to be uh, the, the cornerstone of our portfolio. So uh, in order to, to meet our goals uh, of providing that dependable power Clean energy. Uh, that, that we'll have to continue to uh, find innovative ways to, to make that happen. So we, we do have uh, three stations that we currently own and operate: two in Tennessee and uh, one in Alabama. We are uh, pursuing the potential and possibility of, of building uh, small modular reactors. We are kind of in that society. Feasibility phase right now. The uh, site that we would opt for is at the Clinch River facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, take a tour of that facility yesterday. The group that's here at Kingston this week. Uh, it's an exciting time for us. We're uh, not only do we feel like we're uh, providing value and uh, 
potential new technology for this region. We feel like the whole nation will benefit the whole industry. I'm glad that we're out meeting. So we're uh, we're obviously uh, partnering and have an open uh, line of collaboration with our uh, peers up north at OPG. So they're a little bit further ahead, but uh, we're we're taking that uh, and leveraging what they're learning and, and put it in place here, here as well. So um, we are also, as Michael had mentioned, we are utilizing the, uh, the contracting methodology of the industrial integrated project delivery. We feel like the complexity, uh, the timeliness, the uh, regu regulatory uncertainty, we feel like that, that model is, uh, is key to, to allowing us to uh, kind of take those issues on and, and mitigate them in real time. And that, that contracting model allows us to be the best case for, for success. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, is, that, is that good? Yep. That, that's the last slide. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, Bill, are you on? I am. Can you all hear me? Okay. You can? Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Industrial Integrated Project Delivery, or I2PD. The original research was performed in, in, we started the research project under RT341, CII's RT341 in, in 2016, investigating the applicability of integrated project delivery or more collaboration integration in the industrial project sector. Um, and we reported out our findings in, of 341 um, at the annual conference of 2018. And we recently had a subsequent follow-up study, RT383, that was presented at the annual conference uh, last year, a year ago, August of, of, of 2022. Um, Industrial Integrated Project Delivery, or I2PD, essentially is an outcome-focused project delivery method. And it, it's defined by nine principles, which you can see in that Parthenon framework. Each of those pillars represent one of the nine principles that, that have uh, balanced elements of collaboration and integration um, and are supplemented by 22 implementation methods to help implement um, or support collaboration integration throughout the, throughout the project. Um, and, and really what the way we see I2PD is a comprehensive framework. And so you see the, the terminology framework, um, or you could also think of it as a recipe of ingredients to achieve an environment structure of collaboration that really creates this best for project decision-making. Um, again, through these nine principles, 22 methods, and um, measured by a metric that was created in RT341 was a CI index or collaboration and integration index that was created to help measure the amount of collaboration and integration that was used uh, on each of the industrial projects. Can you go to the next slide, please? Advance the slide. And, and so the further, so RT341 really was, uh, the investigation was, is there benefit to use of, of I2PD on, on industrial projects or specifically benefit of collaboration integration on, on industrial projects and, and the, the results of the findings of RT341 were resounding yes, there is extreme benefit um, to, to incorporating more elements of collaboration integration as defined within the I2PD framework um, to the point where one, once a certain threshold of, of collaboration integration were achieved on the project, uh, we really, out of our 85 projects that we investigated, there were no projects that were performed below average. Um, and many of them were well above average performance in the in the standard project performance metrics that would be used in the industrial sector. Um, and so our next question was, uh, there is benefit to, to collaboration integration, extreme benefit. The next question is, what is a good fit project for industrial integrated project delivery? And, and, and really there was a deeper investigation um, performed in RT383, the subsequent research study that you're able to find in the knowledge base. And, um, CAI's knowledge base, and, and what we had found on the, the subsequent study was, well, all all candidates are, are appropriate candidates or could benefit from I2PD, but the projects that benefit the most that we were able to identify were projects with high levels of uncertainty. 
Um, and really, we look at uncertainty in industrial projects. We look at uncertainty either in the in the design phase or the design of these industrial projects, or in the in the construction um, portion or execution phase of, of the project. And so, really, projects that another way to look at that is a, is a projects that that uh, there's a there could be value for or an opportunity to increase design optimization or good candidates and or projects that that uh, have a lot of construction risk in the, in the execution phase of the project are also very good candidates for for this I2PD delivery. Um, we can advance this to the next slide, please. Um, and so we talked about some of the benefits and really, really one of the key benefits that we see for I2PD is this increased certainty or project performance certainty or outcome certainty. And, um, and again, this delivery method is an outcome focused method, um, best for project decision making. Um, and, and really that's what, that's what enables um, this delivery method to really achieve that outcome certainty. Um, and really we found outcome certainty across the board. Um, across all the key metrics um, definitely significantly improved schedule and cost certainty that that was born in the data as well as uh, some of our preliminary findings in the longitudinal study as well um, and, and one of the the other key elements is is uh, promotes optimum and faster designs with with achieving the same quality um, of designs and as well as uh, facilitates that one team approach um, to adjust adapt to any changes that that the project may see throughout the, the course of delivery uh, could we go to the next slide please and so just just talking about these are the the, the 20 22 20 23 methods um, um, that that are incorporated in the i2pd framework um, now we we are we are constantly assessing the, these methods and their applicability on industrial projects, and you can see these methods are are not are are not necessarily unique to I2PD or, or or unique necessarily to the industrial sector. Now they all have application within the industrial sector. Many of these are already existing um, CII best practices that that are utilized. For example, front end planning is one, and some of these are also existing uh, methods that are used in 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 um, parallel sectors, commercial sectors through lean construction. Um, and so many organizations are already familiar with, with many of these methods. Now, the word I2PD um, uh, separates itself as this, these are, are, are these methods are packaged together with the various different principles and executed under that overall overall recipe um, to deliver this project on those high levels of collaboration and integration. Could we go to the next slide, please? And and this is just some guidance, and, and this this um, this chart can be found in our RT three eighty three implementation um, guidebook report that was that was published um, earlier this year, and, and really this is just providing some guidance on on when um, e e that what project phase um, each of these methods would 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 could be implemented or have been implemented on industrial projects successfully and where the benefits are at each of these phases or stages throughout the project of, of utilizing these various different methods. And again, um, there, there's other information that's incorporated in the guidebook and I and I, I, I definitely would, would like to refer everyone to that CI knowledge base guidebook for um, any and all information on the implementation of IT, ITBD. I know Bruce is gonna talk in more detail, but, but they get, there's a published guidebook um, that is available along with a couple tools that were developed throughout the research for finding what is a good fit project as well as identifying what which which of these principles and methods um, could best be utilized on, on your specific industrial project as well. There's a, a CI method selection tool um, available on the knowledge base as well. So, so with that, um, I, I appreciate your time this morning and I'll, I'll pass it over to Bruce for implementation. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Um, so the next part of the presentation, we're going to take you through a little bit of CII um, best practices and how we're organized to promote and develop those best practices through what we call uh, uh, these CBA committees, the communities for business advancements, if I remember correctly, the acronym. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Kathy, and she's going to talk about uh, industrial modularization, uh, and that's a, our 
and modularization CBA is just going to talk about how that is a best practice works and how it's developed and um, why that's one of the practices that, that is used within collaborative contracting here at the CIF. Kathy, yeah, you... Nick. yeah, I'm here. Okay, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what, what we kind of wanted to talk about is kind of also the collaboration of having the modularization CBA in, in you know, integrating and, and collaborating with uh, integrated project delivery. Obviously, it's one of those, uh, the best practices that we believe, especially on these SMRs, will help uh, help with reducing some of the costs um, and, and helping with some of using that, some of these best practices to do that. So this is the... Um, 283, uh, RT 283 was back in 2013 when this best practice came out um, for industrial modularization. Um, and it really went through kind of some of those uh, execution plan differences because it is, is it is a different um, execution and design uh, that you need to actually understand that and um, be able to plan for that. So the one key thing with the mod industrial modularization, you have to implement it earlier and bring in the appropriate, um, I guess you can say, contractors in earlier, which with, with IPD, with the integrated project delivery, I think that works out very well. Um, we just recently, so RT uh, 283 was the best practice back in 2013, um, and we recently just finished an RT 396, which is the business case analysis for modularization, which we have adjusted some of the timing for um, implementing or deciding to modularize now to basically the business planning the fell one phases so just as a note it is an earlier you need to to get in earlier um, for specifically around modularization and deciding to modularize this uh, best practice also goes through some key success factors and um, some enablers so it is a very good uh, CII best practice in, in the modularization CBA um, is actually really excited about the, the SMRs and, and being involved on, on how to better uh, to, to modularize and, and uh, how to better uh, maybe even reduce the plot area of these uh, SMRs to reduce the overall cost. Uh, next slide, Michael. This is just, uh, we had case studies in here for um, multiple projects um, and uh, how, what the reduced cost, the differential in cost was um, so this was back in 2013, and we've got even more case studies now. We've got even more projects that have been modularized, both big mega projects and also smaller projects. So um, modularization has been used, is being utilized now more globally um, for different reasons. Back 2013, a lot of it had to do with, you know, labor productivity at site and, and trying to improve that. Now there's a lot more um, reasons um, and um, projects are looking at modularizing. A lot of it is to reduce costs, but also cost certainty, um, schedule certainty, those type of factors are coming into play now more. And, and skilled labor, lack of skilled labor is also another one. Um, so with the industrial modularization, you saw one of those key points being standardization in um, that was a, a key kind of, I guess, um, partner with modularization. It, it, it goes hand in hand. Um, so I wanted to just talk about, so this is the key cost around modularization. I wanted to just bring up the next slide and talk a little bit about standardization because I, we think that um, in, in a lot of our modularization CBI, uh, CBA members were participating in the facility standardization research that was, um, I think we finished in 2019, I, I hope, don't quote me on that, uh, 2019. Um, uh, the research that we presented at uh, the annual conference. And this is actually hand in hand with modularization. So uh, with the facility standardization, it's really um, now standardizing some of those modules, some of those components, which we also believe for those small scale uh, SMRs is gonna be critical, obviously for, for regulatory and, um, and helping uh, also reduce the cost, you know, for the, the, the programs, for the multiple ones that are coming into play. And so there is another research that um, I believe we called it UMM001, and it was facility standardization um, uh, for, in, it was, we, we focused on industrial projects, heavy industrial projects. And uh, we came up in here, we also got some work processes and business case analysis. 
um, and critical success factors. Now, this is another key that needs to be done earlier on. So but both of modularization and standardization, you need to actually plan for this and implement it as early as possible on the project. So very key for, for these SMRs is to really look at um, implementing some of these processes and, and starting to plan for this um, early, as, as soon as possible, actually, if you're if you're already in the planning phases. So just bringing to light um, some of these key uh, integration methods that I think are going to be very important to reduce the cost of these SMRs. The next slide, I believe we have some case studies also on, um, or some, I guess, metrics on what um, some of our case studies that we actually had in that research um, saved. So some of them was 25% uh, cost savings and 15% and in schedule. Now, this was an average. And some of these were uh, fully modular and some of them, them weren't. So this cost savings sometimes didn't take into consideration um, the modularization aspect of it. But and in the schedule savings um, was also an average. But this is something that's key, I think, also to um, to implement on on these SMRs. So the last, at the next page, uh, our next slide, Michael, um, just to conclude. Um, so with the modularization CBA, we're we're really uh, excited about um, being participating and helping trying to reduce this cost with both the modularization and standardization. Um, and you can kind of uh, what we've been calling it or something that's come into play is called productization, <laughs> and that's combination of the the modularization and standardization. Um, so uh, these are our key components and key planning uh, methods or integration methods that I'm we're hoping to uh, implement on SMRs to reduce the overall cost and provide a little bit more cost and schedule certainty. So with that, um, that was a little introduction. Thank you. So hopefully, uh, that was good. Thank you, Kathy. Um, as uh, Dr. Phil talked about when he uh, looked at those 23 methods on a few slides back, uh, um, each of those methods, uh, modularization and standardization as one example, they explode out into a deep breadth of knowledge that has been developed through research and application and validation, some of which Kathy talked about. Um, to how effective these methods are. And what we've found in the uh, industrial integrated project delivery, if you bring enough of these methods together in that framework or in that recipe uh, metaphor that Phil used, uh, organized in the right way, you get a cumulative benefit from using all of these methods sequenced depending on which phase of the project you're on. So I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, our next, uh, CBA, which is the Supply Chain Management Group. Um, they do a number of things about uh, in the Supply Chain Management Group, aimed particularly at improving how on industrial projects we improve how owners and suppliers and contractors and equipment suppliers and engineers all work together. Uh, and improve how we work together, regardless of the contract delivery model. Uh, but specifically, what we've been looking at uh, through the lens of integrated project delivery is how some of these best practices particularly apply to uh, large industrial projects that are being managed as collaborative uh, contracting um, projects. And so the one that we're going to talk about here today is, is a concept called early supplier engagement. And you heard Kathy talk about it as well from a um, from a uh, modularization point of view. Uh, early supplier engagements on most projects, but in particularly on collaborative contracts where the conditions are set up, the contracting conditions are set up to allow that to happen formally. Uh, brings to the table you know an old adage that uh, is up there that many hands make light work and the graph on the right here kind of talks to those many hands coming together from an owner's point of view a contractor's point of view and a supplier's point of view and it talks about how we come together from a competency point of view uh, there isn't any single organization out there that has all the answers all the experience and uh, 
the reason we've come together as CII is to share that experience, use that in-depth research and that uh, industry knowledge to develop better methods. And one of the ones that we presented out um, at the 2022 annual conference in Cleveland was uh, early supply engagement. And so the, 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 the real benefit that this research shows, and uh, there's uh, a, and follow on presentations and, and working groups, is that by bringing together those organizations with each of their core competencies early in a project uh, development phase, you get better decisions made early, which have downstream long term effects on the project. And, um, there's some math behind this. I encourage the, those. It's an older research topic, but it still applies today. RT 130, uh, where this uh, graph comes from, really drives home the benefits of bringing suppliers in early. And in particular, what this year's annual conference, where the group of us came together, the owners uh, that were looking at building some SMRs, the suppliers, uh, one in particular in the the uh, uh, piping area, another in the concrete area, and a third in, in the small uh, hand tools area. And in a brainstorming session over the course of two hours, we came up with four or five ideas in a formal setting on how we think we as an industry could improve the impact of, and the time it takes to plan and develop these SMRs. If we're going to hit those numbers, Having an, an annual or having a, an average delivery time from start to finish that's in that 10 to 15 year range is just not going to cut the mustard. So we're not going to get there. And as those of us that are here locally uh, in uh, at TBA on, on, on an outing, we were fortunate enough to see the, the, the Clinch River site where the new SMRs for TBA are going to be built. But right next door, Within 15 minutes is uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, and that was the uh, World War II effort to uh, develop a nuclear weapons. And, then, and uh, what they were able to do in two years, to complete, and the scale on which they were able to do it in two years, tells us that we, as uh, smart, intelligent people with all the technologies and methods available today, we should be able to bring that duration down from 10 to 15 years. We're going to have to be producing multiple of these units and have them go live by 2030, 2031. Uh, and that the, the, the graph to, to hit the uh, density levels that we need for these new small modular reactors uh, is you know, almost, almost uh, vertical. Yeah. So um, through, it's through early supplier engagement that we bring these ideas to the table um, and look for ways to bring down the cost and the schedule. So that's uh, supply chain management and it's a focus group we have here at CII. Um, and, and this is an example of some of their research. Uh, the other one I want to talk to today, and, and, and I think we have nine CBAs and given the time and the, the, the breadth of the topic here today, when we focused on three. The other one that, that really becomes important is the uh, quality management CBA. Uh, our quality management CBA takes a look at the quality management methods, programs. Um, they come together as a group and discuss that and how these things get applied and get improved on out in um, our industrial project. And in particular, one of the uh, research topics that they developed is there's best practices in quality management for capital facilities. Um, and uh, I encourage anybody that is looking to improve how they do quality management uh, out there to take a look at that uh, research document as a starting point. But specific to the nuclear world, and nuclear, like oil and gas, like mining and minerals, everybody thinks that what they need is and, uh, uh, to do 
is unique to them and is more stringent than anywhere else. Uh, and having had the, the fortune in my career to work, to work across uh, most industries, um, while some industries take longer to get there, the elements are a lot of the same, but the, spe the specifics of, of these quality management pro uh, programs are deep and detailed. And it takes time to learn how to apply a quality management pro uh, program in the nuclear world, uh, which is different in, in the fossil fuels, the hydro generation world, or the mining world, or the oil and gas world. Uh, the nuclear uh, quality management programs, as you see on the right there, uh, it's out there, it's published, it, it, it's, it's, it's formulaic. But it takes time and effort. It takes, it's a journey. It's a journey that takes about a year from the time you as an organization say, we want to work in the nuclear world. We want to be qualified in the nuclear world. And so we're, we're part of that qualification is to develop a quality assurance program for your particular nuclear work, whether you're a manufacturer, an engineer, or a constructor. And then not only does it take time to develop that, but depending on the size of your organization, it takes even longer to implement that throughout your whole organization. The whole management of change uh, exercise comes in. And so, you know, sitting here in 2023, knowing we've got to build all these small modular reactors and, and new nuclear reactors as well, uh, up to 2050, we have time to get our supply chain qualified and trained uh, under the specifics of uh, nuclear management quality requirements. And so what I've listed here um, is, uh, is some of the U.S. Um, uh, standards that, that you as an organization will have to meet. And so I'm not going to go into much more detail than that. Suffice to say, it's a deep industry out there. It, Getting it right up front it is not um, um, it, it, it is, it's not something you, you can avoid if you want to be in the nuclear uh, design, construction, and build world. You have to have it, or you just don't allow it to participate. And that comes down to the commitment that nuclear as an industry has made to society to design and operate these nuclear facilities uh, safely over a long period of time. So that's our third CBA. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Burwell. And Bruce is going to talk, take us through um, how you go about implementing industrial integrated project delivery and specifically talk about some of the lessons learned and how we apply this in the SMR. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. So I'm going to take a few moments here and give you a quick overview of how we implement. We, we're certainly not saying industrial IP is, is applicable for every every project, um, but specifically for this these SMR projects, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly beneficial uh, to use a collaborative contracting model. You know, there's a number of uh, participants, <clears throat> project uh, participants in, in these types of uh, these types of projects from the owner, you know, the uh, Engineering houses that you would uh, that you would partner with, uh, constructors, uh, OEMs. Um, it's it's based on one integrated team, but that's within that's within the project. But there's also uh, external stakeholders uh, that need to be considered as well, uh, from uh, regulatory bodies to uh, local communities, uh, indigenous communities. Uh, Etc. So, uh, with this type of contracting model, it's, it's all about uh, early engagement and collaboration, uh, collaboration uh, amongst all of those, uh, all of those different parties. So, within within the project itself, this is a typical org chart uh, that we develop. You know. And starting with the blue boxes uh, on the top, uh, you 
have the owner, but right underneath the owner is the project executive committee. And that is made up of members from all of the uh, parties within the project, from the OEM, the constructor, uh, your, your engineering um, partner, your project integrator. Um, these folks are, are providing oversight in, in the project. And the core group underneath, um, before I move on to the core group underneath, I, I must say that uh, senior executive support for this type of contracting model is extremely important. Um, we've, we've witnessed uh, a couple of projects uh, in the recent past where the project team started down using this type of uh, contracting model. They even went as far as selecting uh, the, their partners, um, but they didn't have the, the, the senior executive support and they eventually reverted back to uh, traditional type models that they were accustomed to. So, uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying they're bad organizations, uh, I'm saying they weren't ready uh, to implement this type of contracting model. And, and, and you just don't uh, decide, you know, tomorrow we're going to implement uh, industrial integration project delivery. Um, it takes some, some, some time and effort to orientate your, we're talking about the owners, to orientate your, your, your team, identifying uh, process, benefits, et cetera. But the key is to have your senior executive support and then educate all of those uh, support groups underneath on how the model is actually works. Now, with, uh, within the core group, these are your PMs of, uh, of the team. And again, they're, they're represented by the owners team, the OEM, uh, engineer, constructors, Etc. So they're doing the day-to-day -day management of or providing the day-to-day -day management of the project. And uh, with, underneath the, the core group, we have what we call the project integration team, PIT team. These are the engineers and constructors that are actually planning, uh, planning and engineering the work, you know, through multiple uh, disciplines identified there, and each one of the, the partners um, participates within each of those pit teams. Now there's a pit team lead, and, and it's uh, the best athlete approach, so it's, it's not an owner or, or an owner's uh, resource leading each and every one of those pit teams. Right? So you know, uh, who's best suited to, to Leads those those teams, licensing and permitting with an SMR type project uh, probably is most appropriate to stay with the owner. Okay. But uh, construction pit uh, pit team lead, the the constructor would likely be best suited to uh, to lead that team. So uh, this this can be broken out even further. Um, Depending on the magnitude and the, the size of the scope, so if you wanted if you wanted to break down your scope packages within an SMR program, you might have uh, this type of organization set up for for multiple functional areas. Next slide, Mike. So this slide is showing uh, the the typical phases. So when would you when would you consider uh, this type of contracting model? Well, we have a tool for that, and that tool uh, that tool was developed through our CIR research team. And it's an IPD project uh, selection tool, and there's it's it's very 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 similar to to a PRI, and a lot of us are accustomed to using the PRI tool. Uh, it's a workshop that uh, you know all of the, the owners team would participate, you know, your engineering team, your supply chain team, uh, legal, uh, construction, etc. 
and it's a facilitated exercise and there's there's, uh, there's a number of engineering questions and there's a number of construction risk questions and you work you, you go through that workshop and we come to a consensus on the scores that are very very similar to, to a feeder eye and at the end of that workshop it will identify whether your your project is best suited to see the benefits of IPD as a, as a contracting model. If not, it'll identify the uh, traditional types of uh, contracting model. So that's that's where you start. So in uh, with the with these SMR projects, it's a slam dunk that uh, collaborative contracting is the optimum contracting uh, strategy uh, for these types of projects. <clears throat> So you've identified now that uh, this is this is the contracting model. From there, you move into what we call the procurement phase, and, and we like to we like to uh, use a three-step process from the express of interest uh, through the through the written proposals uh, through oral presentations uh, during the during the RFI uh, phase. I'm going to talk about that in another uh, another slide or two. Once the team is selected, you move into the validation phase, and Mike uh, touched on uh, a little bit earlier. And through that validation phase, what you're actually doing is your your um, verifying scope. Your your removing all of the assumptions that may be made. That the, your partners uh, um, have uh, identified in their in their proposals, and you're also identifying your owner's requirements and the owner's expectations. You want to completely uh, tear apart the scope, roll it back up, and remove all of the assumptions being made by, by any of the partners. From there, you're developing your integrated risk plan, your integrated schedule, your integrated uh, uh, your integrated estimate, um, your risk reward plan, and all your preliminary construction plans. Once once there's enough design completed during that validation phase, um, you start the negotiation of your multi-party agreement. And at the end of the at the end of the validation phase, uh, you know, and we're we're recognizing that you need about you need about 30% of detailed design done before before the partners will put uh, put their profits at risk. At that time, they'll sign on to the multi-party agreement. From there, you move into the pre-construction phase. So pre-construction phase, you're finalizing all of the all of the preliminary plans that you had started uh, during the validation phase. You may be doing some early procurements, uh, long lead items, uh, et cetera. And at that point, you're, you, you could uh, you know, add scope, remove scope, transfer scope you know, uh, amongst the parties. Uh, we've seen that. Um, we've seen, you know, on the owner, I'm speaking from the owner side. We uh, we have expectations of who uh, would be best suited for scope, but through the validation and pre-construction phase, uh, sometimes it's been identified that hey, um, contractor A or contractor B, you're you're much better uh, suited to execute that scope or or to be responsible for those procurement packages. Uh, Etc. So all of those all of those preliminary uh, designs are finalized. All the preliminary planning is is finalized during that pre-construction phase, and then you move into execution. And in this case, uh, you know execution is going to take uh, X amount of years for these SMRs, um, but commissioning. And close out. Commissioning would be started back in the validation phase. The the commissioning activities for these these SMRs, you know, that's going to be an extremely lengthy process, you know, 12 months, 14 months, etc. The planning for that commissioning phase uh, would start early on during the during that validation phase. Next slide. 
And with this, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Mike uh, to wrap things up before we move into the next few minutes. Yeah. So when we started this presentation off, uh, and I went through it fairly quickly, um, we talked about the decision by society around the world to change the way it produces energy. We are moving to electricity at an increasing rate. Um, and not only are we moving to electricity at an increasing rate for an existing demand, the demand for electricity is going up at an increasing rate. And that's all to meet societal's goal to, to get to net zero by 2050. And there's lots of debate around that whole topic. Um, but where I happen to sit, <clears throat> Adding nuclear as a base load around the world is a good thing based on my life experience and most people that I work with out here. And so to be able to do that and to be able to do that with flexibility and uh, as to where you put your energy supplies, the small modular reactors, as a new method of delivering nuclear energy has come into being. And it's a reality. As you saw here today, a number of companies already started down that path. Uh, and it's beginning to pick up ahead of steam. As you've seen, governments, not only here in Canada and the US, but around the world, are setting aside dollars to ensure that that happens. There's a lot of work that has to happen in industry to get ready for that. We need to improve our transmission grids, our distribution grids, and our uh, distribution capabilities out into the local gas station or the local home uh, where uh, some of these new technologies like EVs will, will sit. And so once you make that leap of faith that SMRs are going to be and the, the, the volumes of SMRs that we're going to need to, to meet our energy requirements uh, is beyond anything we have ever seen a, as a global society. Then you have to take a look about the, the you have to kind of figure out how are you going to get there. And you know, I would have loved to yesterday when we we're out at the uh, Manhattan Project site there, I would have loved to have spent more time than we had just understanding the project management methods, the people methods. We saw turnstiles there for us. How many was it? 8,000 workers in there? Turnstiles that allow these workers to come in, punch in. Go to work, do what they were doing, build this facility in two years, and come out. And without the support of accounting systems, uh, electronic accounting systems, and laptops, and Excel, those 8,000 workers every day managed to get their timesheets in, collated, and get paid at the end of the week. Uh, and they, in, in addition to, to that administrative load, they, they were able to build the facilities they were building. They were building while the design of those facilities were happening because this was a first of a kind uh, facility that was built. And if they could do it back then with the tools that they had available to them back then, certainly we can do that today. And so we can learn from that. And so one of the, one, one of the methods that we believe that it's going to take is an intense level of collaboration. Not only on a on a SMR by SMR basis, but many of, of the utilities, many of the energy companies, they're looking at programs where they're going to build 10, 20, 30 of these units within their 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 market areas. And so there is an opportunity to improve the way we build things in the industrial world and, and, and take some lessons from history. And also take some lessons for some of the more future looking folks. And you take a, a look at Elon Musk and one of his gigafactories. Mm -hmm. Four years ago, there was 350 parts in the, in, in the body of the Tesla. Today, there are three main parts, and they're made on site in the factory. And we're going to have to do the same thing. I mean, that's why we picked modularization. We're going to have to figure out how to build these plants. In such a way as to drive down cost, because uh, cost is important, but be also because of the scarcity of labor. Uh, and we're going to have to find a way to design these plants and build these plants using all the methods, all methods available. So, 
in my experience and in the experience of those of us that have been involved in this cloud contracting world, that creates the legal and organizational framework to apply the methods, the 23 methods or however many methods it's going to grow to, apply them in an organized manner that's not generally available in, under traditional contracting. One of the benefits of cloud contracting is that it brings upfront planning dollars to the table early to allow us to organize and plan correctly and incent each other so that we're all incented for the outcome of the project, not incented for our, our own individual individual uh, goals. And so because of that, what we have found is that cloud contracting through the research we've done, the projects we've worked on, uh, projects that are ongoing out there, and then the cloud contracting is a growing delivery method, still a small delivery method, but a growing delivery method that we're seeing more and more. And one of those reasons is because it increases certainty of outcome, certainty of success. And as a matter of fact, if we found in a number of areas, um, the outcome are actually better than what we planned. We're normally conservative folks here in the industrial space. We have a ton of scar tissue on all our backs in terms of the, when we plan projects, and something came up. I mean, how many of us around here planned for COVID? On our industrial products, not one of us. How many then said, okay, COVID's over and we're ready to get back to work? And then supply chain came out of nowhere and bit us all with, with, with components that normally would take six weeks to order, now taking two years. Um, so, cloud contracting del delivers not only uh, increased certainty, but well, from what we've seen, actually, it improves the level of outcome as compared to additional. Collaborative contracting, you know, one I would say one of the biggest benefits, this is on a personal level, is that one team approach. Those of us that are professionals in the construction world, in the engineering world, there are many projects, what I call chaos projects, that are just not fun to work on. And you have to struggle to get out and go to work. There's just so many of them. We all have them in our career. These collaborative contracts, well, it's not kumbaya, you still have passionate discussions about the issues. They're fun because those passionate discussions are about what's the best way to achieve a particular goal on the project rather than, oh my God, I really don't want to work on this project, but I have no choice to work on the project. So people in these collaborative contracts, um, in the research that we've done and our, our experience, is they want to come to work. People within organizations want to get on the collaborative contract within an organization that has multiple projects rather than beyond the, the traditional delivery methods because they're fun. Uh, they're challenging and they help with career goals. Um, one of the other benefits is incentives. Uh, even though collaborative contracting requires everybody to be aligned financially, again, because of what we've seen in increased certainty and actually improvement of outcome, there's more dollars to share for all the participants than under the traditional methods where you're into claims and, and, uh, and lawsuits and bankruptcies uh, that happen in a poorly run large mega project. And you know that all comes down to this uh, reduction of risks. By choosing to work together, by formalizing it under a multi-party agreement, by each sharing the risks and coming to understand through the way these projects are organized that you have a voice at the table, what we call equitable decision making. What you learn is it's not just about your voice, it's about you hearing from your colleagues around the table, uh, given their specific disciplines, you get to hear their good ideas. What you find under this delivery method is that more often than not, the best idea rises to the top. And when the best idea rises to the top consistently, day in and day out, the risk on a project for all parties is significantly reduced. And with that, Jenny, we're going to turn it back to you and open the floor for questions. Yes, sir. Okay. 
I will advise you to handle this one delicately, Mike. <laughs> Is I2PD a better framework than advanced work packaging when used early in the project? <laughs> um, they are actually two different things. So advanced work packaging, is one of the 23 methods. It's actually, if you go back to the slide, it's the number one method there. And it's one of the 23 methods that uh, IQBD suggests to use on these big industrial projects. Um, AWP is, sorry, AWP Advanced Work Packaging is used in conjunction with other methods and as you combine these other methods, there was a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, down in Houston where we actually looked at combining advanced work packaging, lean, man lean management technique, construction techniques, and the uh, uh, project production management techniques. And through the framework created by industrial project delivery, the participants get to actually plan out and organize how you're going to use these different methods and where you're going to use these different methods and where the handoff is from one method to the next method as you go from phase to phase to phase. Anybody else want to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. You know, the you know, industrial integrated project delivery, I would say, is, is the band that holds all of the methods together including AWP. So the contracting model, you know, is, is the overarching framework and, and the holder um, and of, of the methods that should be uh, implemented throughout the different phases of so the different uh, phases of the life cycle of, of the project. AWP and I2PD is, is, is two, different, uh, two different topics here. But the contract holds it all together, and the implementation of the methods uh, is, is is then decided amongst the amongst the team, the, the one team or, or the partners, um, including AWP, and that's just one of the methods. Fair enough. Thank you, guys. Okay, our next question is: um, How can you apply this? to water and wastewater treatment facilities? Well, I, I think it starts with the uh, project selection tool that I, that I mentioned. You know, and there's certain criteria with that, with that project selection tool. You know, uh, minimum 50 million, and you got and you got to have three or more stakeholders. So water and wastewater, um, you know, without even, even running that type of project through the tool, it would identify as, as a candidate, a potential candidate for a collaborative contract. If I could add, I don't know what uh, what scale for your question uh, is referring to the wastewater, but I can speak uh, specifically at the uh, power station we're sitting at today. We've got some challenges, um, and we're trying to make some hard decisions about the uh, long-term asset strategy here at this plant. And uh, if we were to extend the life of the plant, it would require uh, significant investment in, in treating and or capturing uh, you know, more than one waste stream. So um, if you're in that, if, if that scale, I can tell you that uh, with the reg again, with the regulatory uncertainty, and since we have deferred decisions, uh, based on potential <clears throat> impending new regulations, we'll have an extremely compressed schedule. Uh, we will, without a doubt, uh, utilize this contracting model for any project uh, that falls into those uh, levels of uncertainty and, and uh, complexities that uh, are sometimes we self imposed on ourselves by deferring decisions. So when we had these projects at Kingston kind of uh, in the in the hopper to execute, we were planning to, to utilize the collaborative contract models as well if they were to here or any other uh, facility that, that requires that kind of work, we'll, we'll do the same. So if that, uh, 
if that's the kind of scale that you're um, thinking about on the wastewater, feel free to reach out offline. We would have a long discussion. Thanks, Rod. And so the other thing, so just to add to that, so wastewater and water come in many different forms, right? And so if you think about a wastewater or water from a linear project point of view, maybe you're doing a new uh, supply line um, into your city, um, or maybe you're upgrading your local municipality's wastewater treatment so that you don't have the storm runoff contaminating your uh, local water supplies and ecosystems. Those projects, again, to the same point as Rod, those projects are complex. There's a number of stakeholders involved. There's a number of regulatory requirements and government organizations that have uh, an interest in various aspects of those projects. And again, starting with what we first talked about, when you take a look at design uh, uncertainties and construction uncertainties and run that type of project through the, uh, the selection tool, the project selection tool, it'll spit out a level of complexity that will help inform whether your project, your particular project uh, should be run as a collaborative contract project or should be run under a more traditional method. Okay, our next question is a little long. Um, they're wondering what contracting methods could prevent a, possibly a contractor who might be contributing ideas during the early engagement that initially appear to be value adding, but in fact add risk to the owner's project, thereby enabling scope growth uh, at improved profit margins. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so I will tell you that uh, transparency is a key principle, right, in, in collaborative contracting, and honesty is another key principle. Uh, so when you're in a room with your peers around the table, you've got smart engineers, smart experienced constructors, experienced OEMs, experienced uh, owner uh, participants, that type of a concept rarely survives personal engagement, right? Um, and it's a great personal risk that you as a participant that would try and raise a strategy that's in your self-interest, that, that your, your colleagues probably politely the first time, it's that you could, maybe you're just having a bad day, but over time if that were consistent, you would be selected out of the engagement by your colleagues. That's the beauty of these transmit agendas are hard to hide when everybody's at the table early. Yeah, I, I want uh, I want prior to that. Okay. What Mike is talking about is after the, the team is selected. Oh, we're just talking about you're going to supplier engagement, yeah. right? With with this type of contracting model, you know, you're you're inviting partners. Uh, participate here that are technically sound. Okay? You're inviting partners uh, to participate that you know may have a history or may have uh, past project experience, similar project experience, etc. But the selection of those of those partners, you you want to select uh, partners that are they may not have collaborative contracting experience, but they're willing to work in an integrated team. Okay? They're not going to be sitting in the weeds, you know, uh, waiting for a risk to materialize because, you know, they're going to suffer just as much as, as uh, the partner next to them. You know, Mike talked about the one team approach. You want to select, uh, you want to select partners that are going to work within an integrated team and be open and transparent. And, and bring ideas to the table early, early on, versus you know once the once the project uh, is in execution, and if if an issue arises, well, you're going to have to work through that issue uh, you know, collaboratively uh, together, or else you know there's uh, there's a potential there of uh, drawing down contingencies, and the whole goal is to preserve the contingencies. Is to make early selection of the of the partners that will collaborate with 
with one another and be open and transparent, etc. Without losing sight of technical uh, capability. Okay, our next question is, do you have any data available that actually validates the cost benefit of IPD? We do. Um, we have it from a number of sources, and, and Dr. Caruso, you jump in as well. Um, you know, industrial IPD is the merger of commercial IPD with what we call infrastructure alliancing because it brings the, that new this new framework brings the, together the elements of risk, um, or sorry, of design optimization to find in the commercial world construction and risk mitigation that you find in the infrastructure world and bring those together and that's part of the foundation so the very first pure play i2pd project was launched by uh, ontario power generation in 2018. we have now built rebuilt this is a refurbishment project we have rebuilt uh, two out of eight units the first unit happened during COVID, so we got hit with the COVID scheduling time. Um, but despite COVID, that first unit still came in under budget. Despite the delays, the schedule delays, the team came together and goes back to what Bruce talked about, the, the desire, the fundamental desire to manage and maintain that contingency school and pool and not waste it was there. And they came in 13% under budget. The second unit, and the second unit there uh, was outside of COVID, but now we're in, they were into this uh, supply chain uh, disruption. And so things that normally would take four to six to eight weeks to order and have delivered will take uh, 12 weeks or 12 months in, in some cases. And again, not only did they improve on schedule despite the supply chain issues, they came in a week early, but still a week early. They again further reduced the, the cost of that project by another 14%. So those are two very specific examples. And Phil, maybe you want to jump in and talk about some of the extrapolation we did on um, the other methods. Well, he may not be here. He may be back in class. But so when we looked at putting this these methods together, out in the commercial world, there's lots of studies and examples that show that. Uh, it improves uh, design and reduces cost of schedule. And same with the alliancing world. Uh, there's one study, I'm going to forget the name of the study, but it's, it's in the uh, original presentation. 324 projects were looked at. Um, Christchurch. Yeah. Well, that was that was a, a different, but this is 324 projects that were looked at. They all came consistently and under budget and under schedule. I think the cost savings were in the neighborhood of about 7% on average. And the schedule savings are around two and a half percent, with one exception. One out of 324 projects didn't meet those improved needs. The rest all came in under schedule. So the, the data is out there, and uh, through CII and the original research, uh, we point to that data. Okay. Uh, I, I'm wondering if this is the same question. This just came through while you were talking. Can you point to an independent study or benchmarking on I2PD? or 3P, P3, that show performance of this arrangement. Is that very similar yes. to what you were, yeah. Yeah, so, and I don't remember the name of the study. There was two or three studies, and then there have been other studies since then uh, that have come out, and uh, what we'll do is we'll commit to sending to all participants, uh, Jenny, uh, a list of those studies. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, Question here about the actual contract condition. Is there a new contract condition for I2PD or does it use the existing one? Um, I'm going to make an assumption about what they mean by contract condition. So if they mean the new contract structure, the answer is absolutely yes. There are a number of templates out there, both in the alliancing world and the commercial IPD world. Oh, um, that were reviewed as part of the research. Then we took a brand new off-the-shelf EPC standard agreement that uh, Ontario Power Generation developed, and somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 different 
construction attorneys and, and commercial folks, we were part of the research that created uh, a new template that is called the I2PD multi-party agreements a template that has to be purpose fit to your project based on who the main parties are engaged and what the specifics of your project are. But that, that template exists um, and, and has been through a number of rigorous reviews um, and continually is, is improved over time as we learn from doing this process. Thank you. Okay, we have a participant who states that they see the benefits of this collabor collaborative contracting, but in general, you need strong decision making on these types of projects. So, how do you decide first amongst equals? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question because uh, that's yeah. the reality. I remember I, I said earlier that this is not kumbaya, right? It's not everybody sitting in a circle singing together. Uh, you have to get something designed and you have to get it built. And um, so the concept, the phrase that we use is equitable decision making. Just because you're at the table means you have an opportunity to voice uh, if you see an idea or, or see a concern. And you not only have an opportunity, you have an obligation. But just because you have an opportunity to voice your opinion doesn't mean you should. And, you know, uh, these are these groups as they come together. They're smart, intelligent people, and they learn. And so equitable decision making comes down to who's doing the work. They should probably have the biggest say since they're doing the work. Who's who's significantly influencing that work? They should have a say. Who's impacted by that work? They should have a say. And when you look at it through that lens, it becomes obvious on an issue by issue basis who should be part of taking the final decision. And just as I you know, this is a, something you learn as a as parent. Um, in the end of the day, the person doing the work gets the final word to say. But you want the opportunity to discuss all the issues, all the alternatives, uh, and considerations that should be made before you make that decision. And you know, the other thing I'll say is not every decision goes through that level of brain. Right? So these are smart people who know their their. Bruce says they're hired for the technical competencies in their area, and so they know how to get on with doing their work. And it's at the interface points when you see this type of equitable decision that can really come into its own. Best for project. The best for project folks are absolutely right. But uh, I'll, I'll just add a little piece about the owner. The owner does not give up the right to make decisions, but if an owner is making a decision, outside of who's best suited to make that decision. It could impact uh, cost and schedule, and it could impact, again, the drawdown and contingency. So the, the owner in, in this type of model has to recognize that they, they need to give up some of that command and control uh, that you, you normally would be used to with a traditional model. So you need to work with your partners, um, but if you have a, a strong, rigid owner's team, and you need to be selective on who you who you pick uh, as your owner's team as well, because not every individual within an owner's team is suited for this type of contract or model either. But the owner does does not give up the right to make decisions. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, we have a great question here. Considering the benefits of SMRs as proven in Russia and other countries, what do you consider to be the barriers to moving forward on the installation of these units in North America? There is a number of industry conferences and those that have an interest in participating in the SMR world, I would encourage you to participate in those conferences. I sat in one such very deep dives and it was two days where we over 70 industry experts of various disciplines were brought together to, dis to discuss those uh, challenges for SMRs. And at the end of the day, we came out with, we didn't come up with the seven challenges we thought that we started with going in, we came up with seven opportunities. And what we did through the two days sessions, 
is we realize that if we're going to build these and we have no choice to build them, we better change the lens and how we deal with these, these, these um, issues that are now opportunities for success. So there are, there are but regulatory licensing is one of the big and to that end, governments, both in Canada and the U.S., uh, the regulatory bodies, the CNSC in Canada, the U.S. and NRC here in the U.S., along with some of their European colleagues, are coming together to improve the way we license these technologies. And we uh, generate the, the permitting process to, to allow these. And so it's at, it's at the beginning of its journey, but we're actually seeing some examples of a move. And so that's one of the, the seven elements. The other big one I'll, I'll talk to is there's two. One, one is fuels. The fuels for these facilities uh, uh, is not generally available. The, the, the HALU and blue fuel technologies, uh, there's not enough capacity in the world. Can it? to build what's necessary. And it takes us long to license the fuel generation and upgrading capabilities uh, as it does to get a, a plant design and build. So that work is underway. And if you've been paying attention, you've started to see some announcements about where North America is looking to increase the, its ability to provide the fuels. And so out of that seven, the other last one I'll talk about is, um, is craft labor. Um, we hear it everywhere. We heard it earlier today at the discussion. Craft labor is going to be a challenge. The benefit of taking this method and the benefit you heard with the modularization and the benefit of the new tools and technology is it's fun to work in these projects. And these are not three or four month projects. These are projects that are executed over years. So the stability, the ability for trades to buy a house and move into an area and raise their family is much easier, uh, and these jobs are much higher paying than, than would have been traditionally the case for construction workers that are moving um, around all the time. So that happens. And then there's a lot of in industry initiatives that are going on right now, right down into the grade school. I said on a couple of different panels uh, where we're looking at moving right into the grade school to help stream because it's competition for labor to stream uh, young children into looking at the, the trades and construction and project management as areas for um, uh, for having long productive careers so those are three of the seven and so all the other four are, are there's industry initiatives to address them as well All right, that was actually our last question. Um, trying to think if we, yep, I've covered them all, just scrolling through and making sure. Fantastic. Well, if do you gentlemen have anything to add before we wrap? Uh, suffice to say, if anybody has a question that they think about and they get it into Jenny, um, we will, as a group, we will uh, create a, a set of answers to these questions. Um, we, we are really going to need everybody that's on this call, and, and it's like, you know, uh, invite 10 friends and then have them go invite 10 friends. If we're going to address this opportunity uh, to improve the way we generate electricity around the world uh, over the next 20, 30 years, and it and won't be most of us in this room doing that. Most of us uh, wouldn't be here. Um, we need to uh, expand this out into the market um, and raise the visibility that this new form of energy uh, is going to provide to us um, and this new form of collaborative contracting that is going to make working on these projects uh, both fun and profitable for all. So thank you, Jenny, and thank you all of you that have joined us here today. Yeah, great content. Thank you for, and of course, now we've got a couple more last minute questions. I think the FOMO set in. Do you guys have a moment? I'll go ahead and read them off. Um, so one person asked if you could please repeat the I2PD guideline or the guidebook. Where can they find that? Um, on the CII website, 
the guidebook is there. It's published under RT383. And we will provide in our response back to uh, the written response to some of these questions. We'll, we'll, we'll um, provide a, a direct link to that. And if you're a member of CII, it's available to you at no cost. And if you're not a member, well, we, Jenny and myself and several others, would love to talk to you about becoming a member. <laughs> um, otherwise, it's available for purchase. Wonderful. I do have one more question, but before we depart, I'll note because there are a couple of questions about this presentation. Yes, I do have the slides. I'm happy to send them out to all of those who registered. Um, we will render this video, edit it, and post it on the CII website. Uh, you'll find that under the blog, so that will take us a day or two. And then our last question of the day. With the success of I2PD, and not a lot of implementation to date. What are the organizational cultures and technical skill set that companies have to overcome to implement I2PD? So, what are those barriers really that you're finding to get the buy in? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to turn this to Bruce in a second. Uh, Bruce, when he was starting on this journey with Ontario Power Generation, asked his executives, do you like the way our projects are going today using traditional methods? I'll let him, I'll let him finish that story. Um, but the, it, it, it's really, it takes a commitment at the top. The, the biggest barrier, is, uh, I hate to say it, but it's the middle management ranks in large organizations. They're designed to deliver what they do today well, and to prevent change. They purposely put into those positions to prevent change. And so this is a change. This affects your supply chain, your legal, your construction, your project management, your engineering. This affects a lot of the company. It affects finance. Uh, you know. So getting that executive leadership in to align that middle management group within large organizations is probably the single most critical factor that we have seen over these last five years as a critical factor for success. And Bruce, I'll let you tell your story. Yeah, for sure. So, so when I asked her how satisfied he was with our planning and execution of our projects, his response was generally. And I said, well, you must be happy because we keep doing the same thing over and over. So, you know, identified, identified the model the benefits, um, but it took, it took some, um, you know, trust to, to implement and try this type of, uh, of contracting model within, within our organization. Um, it, I say it was a journey because, you know, I started at the top. <laughs> You know, once we had senior leadership uh, on board and support of um, all of the other support groups that fell, fell into the line, but we still had to provide uh, orientation and, and training. And, and back at that time, we just started back in 2016, we were developing process um, as, as we went. And a lot of that process then was, uh, you know, has been implemented in the guidebook, um, in, into the uh, project selection tool into the principles and methods selection tool. We didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about that. Um, but the last thing I'll, I'll say is behaviors is, is key. And you you got to identify and target individuals uh, on your team that have the appropriate behaviors for this type of model. When I selected my project manager, she had been with me for less than a year, um, but she had, uh, you know, did she have the technical background of, of, for this facility and this particular project? No, she had zero, zero, but she had the, the appropriate uh, behaviors for collaborative contracting model. She, she was a, a true leader. Um, she could facilitate. Uh, she could empower others around around her um you know so you know if, if you're selecting your team you don't need uh you know a 
gray hair guy like, uh, like Mike and myself has tons of experience that are set in their ways. Um, you want to target individuals that want to do something a little bit different, uh, but have those qualities that I just mentioned. Great answer. That That's great. Yep. Awesome. Okay, everyone. Well, I know today's webinar went a little longer than we normally go, but I think it, it went well. We've addressed all of the questions and we sure appreciate your extra time today and tuning in. Um, Mike, Bruce, Dr. Phil, who's already back to teaching his, his class over at Notre Dame. We thank you, Rod. Thank you so much for hosting, for uh, your contributions today. Uh, please give our team at TVA our best, or your team at TVA our best. Uh, we thank you all. Appreciate your attendance today. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, folks. Bye, everybody.